It's navigating the future. Wintershell's DEA's OSDU deployment approach. The presentation is by Max de Groot and Aline Langhelis. Max, Aline. Good day, everyone, again. Um, again, my name is Max de Groot. I'll skip the introduction again because you already heard it before, so I don't want to bore you too much today with that. Um, yeah, today we'll be talking about navigating the future and, and our deployment approach and mainly focusing on all the hurdles and obstacles that you have to go through to, to get this deployment ready. And then my colleague, Aline, she will present uh, a part of the demo from the Enterprise Data Management Solution from, from SLB. Uh, you can introduce yourself, yeah? Okay, I'm Aline Lanyales. I'm a geologist, but I have been working with the data managers for more than 10 years. I'm working in Terra Nova project and I'm testing the application, ingesting data like wells, seismic, and documents. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, so I tried to, I was thinking of how do I summarize our journey, our OSU journey in one slide. And um, all of a sudden it just popped into my head this program that was in TV, maybe you know it, maybe not, the um, program called Wipeout. And I tweaked it a bit, got a video offline, tweaked it a bit, and came up, hopefully it works, came up with this one. You know, stakeholders, cost reduction, migration mountains, you know, every other excuse you can find not to go ahead. And then you fall in the puddle of all the excuses combined, which is in the company. So she didn't make the finish. Or I have a very good washing machine, or we actually did get there uh, in the end. Um, so we did get approval from the board to go ahead with the deployment plan. Um, and apart from gaining nine kilos from stress eating, uh, it was all fine, our journey. Um, maybe to jump straight on the migration mountain. So what you hear all the time is it doesn't work for all data types, so why do we go ahead? Don't get stuck with this idea, but focus on what is achievable. Be pragmatic. Um, for us, well data size because documents was more than enough to go ahead. We already saw the big advantages there, and we decided to take a few steps to actually you know, um, get our data into OSDU. So the first one was don't build your own data ingestion tooling. We're not big enough for that. We don't have the resources, so we want something off the shelf um, and um, steer maybe development there. Then ensure that these can be used by data managers, not data engineers. Again, we don't want to be doing any coding, any fancy stuff. We just want something off the shelf that works for us, um, that we can do our work with. Train the users, get them to validate it. Um, that's what we did over the past year and a half. And, and improve quality or, or whatever it needs. So we, we wrote down a lot of enhancements and bugs and, or more enhancements that we wanted to see. And those got implemented as well. Then the next step will be prove OSDU as a catalog system. So we want to get rid of our archive databases. Uh, so we want to prove that we can actually, I mentioned it before, regardless of where data is, we want to be able to find it in OSDU. So it needs to work as a catalog. Um, then we want to dissolve some legacy, yeah, the, the legacy archive system, but also some databases that we already see. Uh, those can be moved into, into OSDU. Um, next step would be then move a non-operated asset for 1BU into the OSDU. Is that a success? We go on to an operated asset from 1BU, and then we go on to the next one and then repeat the whole cycle, basically, or part of the steps repeated. Then, um, yeah, when looking at the database that we wanted to, to dissolve, so we are, again, we were a merger of two companies, Vintsa and Dea, and we all had our own uh, data landscape. And we saw that we could actually uh, dissolve 10 databases less applications, uh, which would come alone with a cost saving of 1.4 million euros, which covered in our case more or less already the deployment scenario. And now the question that you need to ask yourself is how many corporate well and seismic repositories do you have? And do you have a similar um, um, landscape in the background? And how many of them are actually no longer maintained or outdated? Then um, the false challenge of app compatibility, compatibility. Yeah, of course, it's true. Not every application that you have works in OSDU. Um, but for the time being, does it really need to be? We said we want to first you know, go for the full data management approach. So we, data needs to be working for data for us. And then we'll start linking applications. But you also need to think 
do I want, because we have a lot of applications in our, in our I won't, don't want to use landscape too much, but in our application landscape, um, the question you need to ask yourself is, do you want to have for every problem an application uh, that's maybe used one or twice a year by one or two people in the company? Uh, maybe you should look at the big hitters first. So the, which of your applications do actually cover 70 or more percent of your subsurface workflows? Um, which we came to three applications, uh, which we could already connect to OSDU. Then also avoid the utopia. So how many of your applications that you have today actually write back to your uh, master repository? Um, having these three big ones already writing back to OSDU, and there's many other smaller applications that actually might link to OSDU as well, isn't that already enough for now? And then build on later in the moment they can. Um, so avoid this utopia idea that you might have of OSDU. And um, when it comes into the, to the big hitters, as we call them, form a partnership. So we formed where we, we wanted to form a partnership uh, for these applications that came from the same provider, um, connect those to OSDU with the data platform, and then you're already more than halfway on the, on the right track. Um, apart from these, also realize how many, and that's also what we learned, I kind of was surprised by the eagerness and easiness of smaller companies uh, that actually make cloud applications, how easy they could connect to the OSDU, how willing they were to share their information also with bigger providers, uh, the collaboration between the two, it was really good to see. Um, so there's actually a lot more possible than you might think initially. Um, there we go. Um, then what we also realize is that we need to go cloud if we go for OSDU. Um, there are, we kind of written down a base case for business cases for, for different options. There was the high performance computing, uh, computer VDI with an on-premise uh, OSDU, which would then be with Azure stacking. Um, this turned out to be, yeah, quite complicated, quite complex, uh, resource intensive. Um, which we didn't have. Then there's the hybrid solution, which is kind of the best of both worlds. You have your, all your applications working on-prem, and then you have this fancy data platform uh, in the cloud where you can do all your um, AI if you want on it. Um, you have it nicely organized, but that also comes with a high cost, um, and also users would have too many different interfaces, VDIs to work with. So that was not for us. Then there's the other last two options, cloud only and cloud only slash managed, uh, where we saw the benefit of going uh, managed. Uh, so your applications in your cloud, so your OSDU deployment is managed by a provider. Um, could go cloud only as well if you have the resources, but we saw that going uh, cloud only and managed was a lot more um, cost efficient for us at least. Maybe a disadvantage that some third party applications might not be supported by the vendor or by your provider. Um, but I guess, yeah, then you go back to the other question. Do you really want such a, uh, such a big heterogeneity in your application uh, portfolio? Then, uh, yeah, maybe the main message is here is that you really need to get your IT uh, infrastructure, your IT strategy aligned with your data strategy. Um, so that is a big, big change, maybe also with the applications. So that's a big change. And then it's kind of the jump to the next slide, which is the um, not unfriendly user, <laughs> which you can read, <laughs> but it's the unfriendly comma user transformation. Of course, we have unfriendly users as well. We all have them in the company, but that was not the intention of this slide. Um, and then maybe a good quote was, I welcome change as long as nothing is altered or different than before. Now the child in me saw another uh, quote, which I also liked, so I thought, ah, put it in as well. Everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change the toilet paper, be the change. So even if you get them on board, you still need to push a bit to actually get them, you know, jumping along and working along. So don't underestimate the change management process. We spend more than 350 hours of internal change managers um, uh, doing various things. Uh, 112 coming from external partners. Um, so in total, we had four change management experts. We had over 35 plus multidiscipline experts involved and over 100 stakeholders. 
So that is not something to take lightly. Really take the change part serious. Because um, even though you want to keep it as small as possible to change, it will be a big impact. So how did we get the skeptics on board? Um, first of all, demos. Demo, 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 demo. Uh, show them what you can do, show them how it's done. Um, show the improvement, also compared to what you had in the past. Um, have interviews, so we had our change managers having interviews with the, with the colleagues, getting kind of personas in, also asking their, um, um, their advice, uh, asking their preferences, and actually we got nice feedback saying like this is the first time in years that somebody asked me for my opinion. Normally it gets pushed down from the top and now I'm actually able to be involved in the whole change topic and the change process, which actually gives more confidence to the people as well. Um, so that is also something that we did. Workshops, so writing out our data lifecycle, then checking how can OSDU, in, uh, OSDU improve our data lifecycle. Also try to figure out what if we go OSDU, what will be maybe a blockage in our data lifecycle, which luckily didn't, uh, there was no, for the, for the data that we wanted to ingest, there was no blockage at the time. Uh, not now that I know of, but you never know in the future, but uh, we didn't uh, identify a blockade there. So that was also good. So two workshops, then make them part of the development. So the bug and enhancements, it's more enhancement than bugs. Um, so if they see something that they want to be improved, maybe not so much on the OSDU, of course, if there's something uh, that they have knowledge on for OSDU, we can push that forward to the forum as well, but also on the application, uh, the data application tool on top of it. So really make them part of the development. Um, train them, train them on the tools, but also give them training on what happens in the background. So we did actually with our partner SLB, we asked them to train our data managers a bit on the mapping, not per se to actually doing the mapping later on itself, because it's quite complex, but at least to have a better understanding of what's happening in the background with your data. And then the last one is actually, yeah, repeated. The power of repetition is very strong, I would say, and also needed in this case. So yeah, it's, it's eat, sleep, always do you, repeat. <laughs> um, yeah, and then a nice quote, I won't read it all out, but a nice quote from our change management uh, group um, on the right side. So again, don't take change uh, lightly, really put some effort and resources into it. Now the next slide I will skip because that is more uh, what I said to this today as well during the panel discussion, um, but that will be our approach for the future. So our, our uh, pathway basically to, to uh, towards August. Um, and then we come, I think I rushed through it. And, uh, not too bad. Um, we'll get to the demo, which will be given by Aline. Uh, uh, just back. a minute. Yeah, just a minute. <laughs> it's on pause now. Yeah. Okay, so this is the landing page when we launched the data workspace. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the users can access all the data uh, available that he or she entitled to. So, so in this, uh, this side, you can see all the models available, like utilities, data opus, and you can see all the data space that users can see. So, all the data types is available in the demo, and now we will have an overview about all the data products available. In the middle of the window, you can see an overview about all the data, and you can also do some special search if you want to see data organized by operator, for example. On the right side, you can see some web maps available, and you can also add some features like layers, but let's see an overview about one wells, and you can see all the data records for this well bar, like well log, documents, fields, everything is also in the top of this window. And going to the details, let's see an overview about this well bar. On the right side, you can see all the related data, like well bar, logs, and also check shot. You can also add a tag, and this tag will be easily to find this data later on. And then I will show you how you can search for each in the global search bar. And then 
just look for the data tag that you just created, you can see the overview about this well check shot or this well bar. Let's talk about documents inside. Once the documents are ingested in your SDU environment, you can extract all the information from these documents, even if it's a scanned image. All the artifacts will be generated and presented. You can go, for example, as you can see here, for the tables, and you can extract this table for spreadsheet, as you can see. And the users can use it later on. So, let's have an overview now about QC rules. You can go to the well bar again and check all the QC rules and QC report that was created for this well bar. And then the users can monitor all the QC rules that run in this window. And you can see all everything for the, for example, for the parent well bar. If you have a QC report, you can check it later on. So, but let's see how we can create this rule. Going to the data quality, the QC score can be automatically certified and published wherever you want. You can decide if you want to push this, this data to OSDU or not. You can also see that you, it's possible to define the threshold auto, uh, manually on the left side. And for example, if the data has low score, you as data manager can check the data again and see what you can do. So, let's see an overview about 2D and 3D seismic. In the next window, you can have an overview of everything, all the data that was ingested. You can also see the map, locations, and go into the details. We can go to the trace viewer, and you can choose in line, cross line, whatever you want. And you can also use some tools available, like scales, change the color bar, or GANs, whatever you want like in the interpretation project, similar. So, finally, I will talk about data package. You, as user, can create a small data package to share. You don't need to share all the data from OSDU. You just create a list of this data, like logs, documents, and you can share it with internal users and also partners, and you can put them like viewer, corner, whatever you want. And then the user can download the, this data and share. It's something good because it's bringing a lot of benefits because nowadays you need to share data by uh, email, tapes, something like that, but now you just upload the data in the data workspace, and then you can have it available for everyone. You can also uh, check the historical of the, this data and check who downloaded it and who uh, did the last update. And that's it from my side. Sorry to be so fast. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Aline. And thanks to SLB to helping us to improve it. Yeah, so maybe to, to summarize real quick, so moving mountains, prove data managers can do it, avoid building your own tools, and start with the BU with the biggest data challenges. That what we, that's what we decided. Um, false challenge of app compatibility. Uh, compatibility. Um, don't aim for the ultimate flexible. Um, be a bit more pragmatic. Um, On-premise chicken and egg, so we did see that we need to go cloud to go OSDU. Um, so have that in place. Make sure that your in, in IT infrastructure or strategy aligns with your OSDU future. Um, and yeah, change management. Get the uh, unfriendly user transformation uh, fixed. Now the next slide, I actually wanted to take it out, but I promised our program manager, Sean Mackey, that I would keep it in. Um, but we have this quote or this, this slogan in the company or in the team, 
which is OSDU, OSD what? OSDU. <laughs> so that was it, thanks, yeah. So thank you for showing us the demo. That was uh, quite cool. That application, EDS, is that Delphi? That is running on Delphi, yes. Um, if I'm, I guess I can say that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm the ISLB, of course, but yeah, it's on, it's on Delphi. The enterprise data solution okay. runs on Delphi, yeah. And is that linked to, I guess, your version of the OSDU data platform? Yeah, or do yeah. You have so the manually... data doesn't go into Delphi, it goes into OSDU. So we purely run the application on Delphi but everything is separate. So if tomorrow we get into a fight with SOB, we want to go to another uh, provider, um, your data is in OSDU, that's all, all separate. So Delphi handles the viewership of all of that data. You didn't have to manage uploading the data into the wall logs, the check shop, all of that. You didn't have to manually manage that. That's all done in the, so you do have to do the mapping, of course. Um, but then once the mapping is done for your, for your data source or for your, for your database or for that data type, um, we could just easily upload it via the tool. Um, so the mapping is done initially, then I have a bunch of logs or a bunch of seismic uh, or documents and I just push that through the funnel, if you want to say it that way, and it yeah. just gets nicely sorted in, in the platform, OSD platform, yeah. Thanks, really cool presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott Kimbleton, IBM. I always love your presentations, and thanks for bringing that back. That's great. No um, you asked my other question, but uh, my other one was around the, um, the trust levels that you had in the data, the drop downs that you were showing. Are those the same as the EM trust ones that we've been seeing within the form, or is that a variant of that? This is what you decide yourself. So if um, based on the QC rules that you implement, the amount of QC rules it will actually manage to, to pass, that's, that will be the base of your percentage quality scoring. And then you can decide, okay, well, with 100%, I of course push it, uh, and I leverage that to whatever, 50%. I think 50, between 50 and 100% is good enough to push. Uh, everything below should not go into OSDU. That will get into like a separate, you can call it maybe a waiting line, and then a data manager or user can have a look. Okay, what's wrong with the data? Can we improve it? Uh, do we still want to push it, yes or no? Um, but that's all, um, let's say you decide that yourself. You decide what kind of QC rules you put in and then what the quality scoring is that you will push into OSDU. Good, yeah. Thanks.